Hello YouTube. How are you guys doing? I thank you and I give you a good morning, a good afternoon, a good evening, a good night. Whatever time of the day you're watching this, I hope you're having a great and lovely day today. It is a bright and sunny and clear and breezy Texas morning here and in the United States of America. Today is Labor Day, so that means a lot of people do not have to go to work today, which includes me. So, yay. Always enjoy a nice extra day off of work. So, we're going to get right into the discussion. All right. All right, class. Take your seats. Pull out your study materials, and we're going to look at your November 1st, 2011 Watchtower with the topic, what is the Bible's view of sex? Ah, yes, Jehovah's Witnesses, you remember this one. We know what the Bible says about that subject. Only missionary style is allowed in the Bible. Oh, I wish I was joking, but it's funny because it's true. But we're not here for that topic. We're here for page 22 when was ancient Jerusalem destroyed? So I'm going to take a time out for a station identification. If you want to, please go to the website of Jehovah's Witnesses. This is my cellular website. It may look something similar to that. And you'll find a drop down menu, which I just pressed. And you want to press. Uh, Publications. Okay, then you'll go into publications. You'll see something like that. I know it's going to look different on your computers. But then you press that drop down screen again and you'll see magazines. Type on magazines and then you'll have the Watchtower and Wake magazines, and you'll just scroll down, scroll down till you get to this part. When you see that on your screen, you want to type in, press that drop box that says all magazines. And you'll select the Watchtower. And then where it says latest, press that one and you select 2011 and then you click search. And then depending on how fast your internet connection is, you will see all of the 2011 watchtowers there. They're all available for download. There you go. See that? They're all there for you guys. You can find all the subliminal images you want with these magazines, baby. Yeah. And let's see. Where are we looking at? Right there. That was, we looked at that one last week. Now we're looking at this one. So you just type on that piece of paper and it will have a couple of options. You can download an EPUB or you can download a PDF. I prefer PDF but that's just me. So anyways, we'll pause for station identification. Alright, we're back viewers. We thank you for staying tuned in our station. The weather is going to be cloudy. Thunderous, thick gloom for the watchtower. Yeah, forecast isn't looking good for Brooklyn Bethel. All right, so let's go back into this article. When was Jerusalem destroyed? And let's look at that box here. Uh, what, what did we talk about last time? Oh, I kind of forgot. And in case you forgot, let's talk about those four bullet points. That first one. It says, secular historians say that Jerusalem was destroyed 
and 587 BCE. And then there's a footnote. There are various ways of expressing dates. In this article, BCE means before the Common Era. And you also have CE and AD, and they all mean the same thing, really. So, let's rephrase that next time, Watchtower. We need to reflate, rephrase this one a little bit. Instead of saying secular historians, let's add all secular historians. Say that Jerusalem was destroyed in 587 BCE. That sounds a little bit more accurate, please. Second bullet point that we learned from our last Bible chronology indicates that the destruction occurred in 607 BCE. Uh, let's revise that one also. Let's get an eraser and just kind of erase that and say Bible chronology does not indicate that it was destroyed in 607 BCE. Again, let's look at Jeremiah 2511, guys. It's pretty simple. <clears throat> Third point. Secular historians base their conclusions on the writings of classical historians and on the canon of Ptolemy. Again, let's erase that a little bit and uh, rewrite that statement. Let's say that secular historians used to base their conclusions on the classical historians and on the canon of Ptolemy. Now they have tens of thousands of cuneiforms to base their conclusions. And then the last bullet point, some writings of classical historians contain significant errors and are not always consistent with the records on a clay tablet. Uh, let's erase that one also and let's say that, um, that the classical historians do not contain significant errors and they are pretty much consistent with these clay tablets. So, now that we've got that out the way, let's take a look at our article. We're going to do this Watchtower style, reading of paragraph 1. Please, brother. The Bible says that the Jewish captives were to be exiled in Babylon until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. When were they released? In the first regnal year of Cyrus the king of Persia. Biblical and secular history agree that this exile in Babylon ended after Cyrus conquered Babylon and freed the Jews, who returned to Jerusalem in 537 BCE. Since the Bible explicitly says that the exile lasted for 70 years, it must have begun in 607 BCE. Now, uh, Watchtower, you're using pretty shaky language here. If you're so confident it's 607, then don't say it must have begun. Just grow some balls and say it was destroyed in 607 BCE, like the historians claim it was in 587 BCE. Paragraph 2. However, most scholars date the destruction of Jerusalem at 587 BCE. Again, all scholars date this. This allows for only a 50-year exile. Why do they conclude that? They base their calculations on ancient cuneiform documents that provide details about Nebuchadnezzar II and his successors. Many of these documents were written by men who lived during or close to the time of Jerusalem's destruction. But just how sound are the calculations that point to the date 587 BCE? What do these documents really show? To answer those questions, consider three types of documents that scholars often rely on. The Babylonian Chronicles, Business Tablets, and Astronomical Tablets. So again, the Bible does not explicitly say that um, Jerusalem was destroyed for 70 years and lay desolate for 70 years. And we know that because of Jeremiah chapter 52. There was a third exile five years after the destruction of Babylon, and that there were almost 800 people who were vine dressers and compulsory laborers still in the city. So it could not have been destroyed and lay completely desolate for 70 years. But we'll continue on. Um, Watchtower, we're already trying to see, we're already seeing that you're trying to be 
sneaky with your wording. Next page, we're, we're going to talk about these different types of tablets. The first one is the Babylonian Chronicles. Alright, what are they? The Babylonian Chronicles are a series of tablets recording major events in Babylonian history. So that's it, basically it. It's a history recap. What have experts said? R. H. Sack, a leading authority on cuneiform documents, states that the Chronicles provide an incomplete record of important events. And we have a footnote, which is a very telling footnote. Why don't we look at it? See that footnote there? Where does that take us to? Let's read this together. Note, none of the secular experts quoted and this, I'm sorry, I can't read that backwards on my screen. None of the secular experts quoted in this article hold that Jerusalem was destroyed in 607 BCE. See that for yourself? You see my notes? Wow. I mean, really, Watchtower? You're going to quote from about a dozen different experts and historians, and none of those agree that 607 was the date? I mean, you're already shooting yourselves in the foot. Why is that? Why couldn't you find that at least one secular historian, one expert, one archaeologist that dates the 607 date? Uh, that's very telling to me that they couldn't find at least one person. So we're looking at what R.H. Sack said. And as you noticed, there is a bit of missing information there in the dot, dot, dot. And also, they quote from him, R.H. Sack, but they do not say where they got this quote from. I imagined that there was some important mi missing information. And of course there is. We won't get into that. You can do that yourself in your own study. Do your own homework, please, I suggest, if you have any questions regarding the dates of 607 BCE. So what do the documents show? These Babylonian Chronicles. There are gaps in the history recorded in the Babylonian Chronicles. See the box below. This box is entitled The Babylonian Chronicles, A History with Gaps. Back to the paragraph. Logically then, the question arises. How reliable are deductions based on such incomplete records? Alright, let's talk about this really quickly. The Babylonian Chronicles provide an incomplete record. Well, duh, I think all the historians know that. And they don't base everything off of this record. You did say quoting R.H. Sack from an unknown source that historians must probe secondary sources dot 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 missing information in the hope of determining what actually happened. Uh, the secondary sources they don't just provide a glimmer of hope what happened during these years. They pretty much confirm exactly what happened in the history of Babylon. So, Watchtower, you're being tricky and sneaky and deceptive already. You know what those tablets say. You don't want to tell us what they say because it proves you wrong. So, let's look at these. Uh, look at that little box. It's just basically stating the obvious. Like, historians really, really base everything off of these incomplete tablets. I mean, if you're doing a puzzle, a picture puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle, and you don't have all the pieces, well, you look for the rest of the pieces. And historians found all the pieces, and it does paint a complete picture of the Babylonian period. All right, let's move on to the business tablets. What are these business tablets? What are they? Most business tablets from the Neo-Babylonian period are legal receipts. 
The tablets were dated to the day, month, and year of the reigning king. For example, one of the tablets states that a transaction took place on Nisan, the 27th day, the 11th year of Nebuchadnezzar, also shown as Nebuchadnezzar II, king of Babylon. And we have another footnote. When the king died or was removed and a new king came to the throne, the remaining months of that regnal year were considered the accession year of the new ruler. And we have a footnote. We're going to explain this accession and regnal years. So, sorry, trying to get that footnote right here. All right, let me read that footnote to you. It says, An accession year was not counted toward the years of a king's rule. It referred to the remaining months of the year until the new king was officially enthroned. All right, so I'm going to try and break that down simply. The accession year are the few months that the king reign, reigned until the first of the year. So let's say, for instance, in the United States, the president is um, he's enthroned as king, so to speak, in November, right? So they would count November and December as his regnal year, those two months. And then his, um, I'm sorry, that would be his accession year, those two months. And then his regnal years would begin in January 1st. He goes January 1st to December 31st, that's one regnal year. And a new regnal year starts January 1st, all the way to December 1st, and so on and so forth. So even his last year will be considered his regnal year, but it would be a partial year. And then the next king would pick up the remaining months as his assessing year, and then the new year started, and now his regnal years began. So I hope that makes a, an understanding. It could be kind of confusing because someone might call his first year his reign and could be referring to his accession year. And someone could say his second year reign, and they could be referring to his regnal year, because his first year was his accession, and then his second year was his regnal. So that's why there's a little bit of confusion. You might see a date, 586 or 587 BCE, and that's why, accession and regnal years. So what have the experts said about these tablets, these business tablets? R.H. Sack examined numerous business tablets from the Neo-Babylonian period. In 1972, Sack wrote that new unpublished British Museum text placed at his disposal completely upset the previous conclusions regarding the transition of rule from Nebuchadnezzar II to his son Amel Marduk, also known as Evil Merodach. All right, let's stop there. I want to show you that orange highlight. Watchtower is going, they're just barking up the wrong tree. They really are. They're trying to disprove unpublished texts. And so it's not working. I mean, you want to you want to destroy these other missing gaps unpublished works by these you know cuneiform tablets and then you want to use an unpublished work to try and destroy the date you can't have your cake and eat it too watchtower it's one or the other moving on R.H. Sack knew that tablets showed Nebuchadnezzar II to be ruling in the sixth month of his last year, which is his 43rd year. So these unpublished works state that he was reigning until his sixth month. Got that? So we could say that he was reigning until June of his last year. But these newly deciphered tablets from the accession year of the following king, his son, Amal Marduk, were dated to the fourth and fifth months of the year. Are you following me? These unpublished, newly deciphered tablets that were supposedly in R.H. Sachs' possession said that Nebuchadnezzar reigned until the sixth month, but another tablet said that his son began ruling in the fourth and fifth months. So we're looking at a discrepancy, an overlap of 
no more than two months. Could that have happened? Could his son have began ruling before he died? Certainly, yeah. But this is only a two-month overlap. I mean, we're not talking about 20 years like the Watchtower has has this problem in their hands, a 20-year gap. And that's what they're trying to push on you Watchtower readers, you Jehovah's Witnesses. So what do these business tablets show? There are further discrepancies in the transition of one king to another. For example, the documents show that Nebuchadnezzar II was ruling in his 10th month, six months after his successor is assumed to have begun ruling. A similar discrepancy exists with the transition between Amel Marduk and his successor, Negra Lassar. Alright, so we have two footnotes in this paragraph. Footnote number 8 and footnote number 9. See those two stars? That one and that one. Like I said, we don't have enough time to go into all of these footnotes because look at this page of footnotes. I mean, I could probably do a video on each one of these footnotes. It's pretty ridiculous. There's a, so much information. I spent two sleepless weeks researching all this information. Every waking moment I had was looking up information. But I do want to talk about one of those uh, tablets that they say that there was a six month overlap. That is tablet BM55806. And yes, it could be dated to the 10th month, but Watchtower, we're not dumb. Apostates do their homework. Uh, this tablet, I'm sorry, it was damaged. Remember when we talked about these other tablets that were damaged and incomplete? We don't want to look at those. We don't base our stuff off of that. They're, they're damaged and it's not a complete picture. So by trying to be sneaky and deceptive and say there was a six month overlap is a lie. Uh, they, uh, that tablet BM55806 that you get this information from, it was damaged and they think it could possibly say the 5th month instead of the 10th month because it was broken right where it said that month. So, I mean, really, the only case you have is a 2 month discrepancy from one tablet from Nebuchadnezzar's reign to his son, Amel Maradoc. So, Watchtower, I mean, you're not pulling a fast one on us. We're, we're doing our homework. We know what's going on here. You're using deception. You're lying to us. So, let's move on. Why are these discrepancies significant? As mentioned earlier, gaps in the history documented by the Babylonian Chronicles suggest that we may have we may not have a continuous chronological record. And then we have a footnote, number 10. Could others have ruled between the reigns of these kings? If so, additional years would have to be added to the Neo-Babylonian period. Oh my, we sound like we have a conspiracy theory on our hands. Who shot JFK? Oh, my Lord. There could be other kings that we don't know about. The evidence is that there is absolutely zero evidence. Zero. That there are other rulers not mentioned. So, I mean, it was a good try. It's a good try, Watchtower. <laughs> I mean, whoo, that sounds like a good story. We should write a book on that one, but let's continue. Therefore, neither the Babylonian Chronicles nor the Business Tablets provide a basis to establish with certainty that Jerusalem was destroyed in 587 BCE. Uh, if you want to pull that card, we could also say that 
these tablets don't provide a certainty that Jerusalem was destroyed in 607 either. So don't try and pull that fast one on us. You can't, we're not buying this crap. Then we got another footnote. Let's read the footnote. Uh, business tablets exist for all the years traditionally attributed to the Neo-Babylonian kings. When the years that these kings ruled are totaled and a calculation is made back from the last Neo-Babylonian king, Nabonidus, what do you know? Oh, look what it says. The date reached for the destruction of Jerusalem is 587 BCE. Oh, Watchtower. You just make me bang my head on the wall. Oh, you just... We're really trying to help you out. I mean, we're being nice. We're, we're trying to prove you right. You just keep shooting yourself in the foot. Why do you say that there are no scholars that you quote that agree on 607? And why do you say all the business tablets date to 587 BCE and not 607? Ugh. Watchtower. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. Okay, footnote ends. However, this method of dating works only if each king followed the other in the same year without any breaks in between. Oh my, we have another conspiracy theory on our hands. Watchtower. Look at that footnote, fellas. You see that, ladies and gentlemen? Read that footnote. Read it. Every word of it. I mean, Watchtower is just lying out of their teeth. Uh, let's move on to our astronomical diaries. Our astronomical tablets. What are these? They are cuneiform tablets.